Roger Larson, an orthopedic surgeon at the University of Washington Sports Medicine Clinic, and what I'd like to talk about today are injuries to the anterior cruciate ligament. And I'm going to be helped today by four patients who have uh, experienced this injury, and as we go along, we will talk to them also about how this has affected them. I'd like to start by first pointing out some basic anatomy of the knee joint. And this is a, a right knee, and I'm going to move the kneecap out of the way so we can see some of the anatomy deeper within the knee joint. And to get quite basic, the bones that come together to form the knee joint are the femur bone above and the tibia below. And four ligaments hold these bones in alignment, and that's what's represented by these brown structures. And by definition, a ligament is a structure that hooks two bones together, and it's, uh, they serve as check reins to prevent abnormal motion. The two on the outside of the knee joint are called collateral ligaments, and they're positioned to keep the bones from moving side to side like so. The cruciate ligaments are near the center of the knee joint and they are res responsible for, for presenting, preventing anterior and posterior translation of the lower bone of the tibia. And by virtue of the attachment points, the posterior cruciate is positioned to prevent the lower bone from displacing posteriorly. The anterior cruciate, which is the one in the front, is positioned to keep the lower bone from translating anteriorly or pivoting out in this direction. Between the bones are the menisci, which are these structures, which are commonly called the cartilage. And the function of the menisci are to make these bones fit together more perfectly. In this plane, the end of the upper bone is a curved surface, while the lower bone is relatively flat. And the meniscus, by fit fitting between the bones, makes them fit together more perfectly. It's a wedge in cross-section and it fills in the gaps, making for a larger area of contact between the two bones. And the reason the menisci are made of cartilage, rather than just being the shape of the lower bone, is that they have a little bit of movement so that one can pivot a small amount and the menisci will move and accommodate that. One of the problems, however, in not having an anterior cruciate is if the lower bone starts to shift, then the menisci start to get loaded in ways they're not designed to take forces, and eventually they start to tear. If they get torn to the point where they need to be removed, then the two surfaces, the femur and the tibia, don't fit together perfectly anymore, and they start to wear the articular cartilage, which are the hard, slippery surfaces that cap the end of the bone. And the analogy we, we like to use is that these, this articular cartilage is like the tread on a tire, and as this starts to wear away, this is what we call arthritis. So the injuries to the anterior crucial ligament is the most common significant knee ligament injury that we treat today. And it, the problem is that it often results in an unstable knee, which makes it difficult to continue with activities like high-level athletics or participation in sports on unpredictable surfaces. And there are approximately 50,000 ACL reconstructions annually in the United States. When we looked at this knee anatomy, we can also look at this arthroscopically. And I want to show just a few pictures of what this looks like in looking through an arthroscope. If we look directly into the anterior aspect of the joint, we can see the anterior cruciate ligament. This is the anterior cruciate ligament going from the tibia on the bottom to the femur up above. And the posterior cruciate ligament is here. We can also see the menisci. We're now seeing a lateral meniscus, this structure right here, with the femur bone up above and the tibia down below. And also a medial meniscus with the femur above, tibia below, and the meniscus in between. We're also seeing this nice, hard, slippery, smooth, white surface on the end of the bone, which is the articular cartilage, which is what we want to preserve. So the function of the anterior cruciate ligament is to restrain anterior tibial translation. So what it does is keeps the lower bone from slipping forward or pivoting out. And it is the primary restraint to that. And when the 
when the anterior cruciate is injured, then that abnormal motion can occur. And people injure their anterior cruciate in a number of ways, but usually it's a sporting injury with, uh, that involves a twisting or a deceleration. And frequently the patient will either feel or hear a pop within their knee and then have a fairly significant pain. And it's unusual to be able to continue. This is not the kind of injury that you continue to ski the rest of the day and then get it looked at later. This is usually the last event of the day. And often there's a significant amount of swelling within the knee joint following this, which is blood that accumulates within the first 24 hours within the knee joint. And often the patient will experience a sensation that the bones have shifted. And when they present with this sort of a history, we know statistically that about 72% of the time they have a torn anterior cruciate ligament. And the way we examine for this is to do what we call a Logman test, but basically we use one hand to stabilize the femur and take the second lower hand and pull forward on the tibia in this direction and try to determine how much motion there, there is by doing that. And in so doing, we not only determine how far that bone moves, but also feel for an endpoint or tightening of the anterior cruciate ligament. And we can further investigate this with an MRI, and this is an example of an MRI of an intact anterior cruciate ligament. And here we see one that's torn off of its attachment to the femur up above. And another reason for obtaining an MRI in these knees is to look for associated injuries, and they occur fairly frequently. We know that the day someone tears their ACL, about 62% of the time, they'll have some injury to a meniscus. And they will also have fractures to the ends of the bones or the osteochondral surfaces about 15% of the time. And other ligaments will be injured about 19%. And this is an example of a torn lateral meniscus. Again, we're seeing the inner rim of the meniscus and the tear right behind that. And we'll also frequently see bone bruises with these ACLs. And this is a fairly characteristic bone bruise that we see. We see a bruise on the end of the femur in this location and in the back of the tibia in this location. And that's because when the bones give way and shift, the lower bone shifts forward and actually impacts against the femur in this location. So what we need to determine now that we've established that the patient has an ACL tear is how do we proceed with the treatment of this. And right from the outset, the goal that we set is that the patient, we want to not have the patient experience repeat injuries to their knee joint because every time they have a repeat injury, they have the risk of suffering meniscal tears and osteochondral damage and premature arthritis. And in some patients, we can manage this non-operatively. But the key to managing this non-operatively is the patient's willingness to back off of their activity level and not do the, the dangerous high-level sporting activities. And so the, the various things that we consider in, in determining how to proceed with this or the age of the patient, uh, this is becoming less of a factor than it was at one time. The, the laxity level, some patients when they tear this ligament are a lot more unstable than others and some are much more dependent upon their anterior cruciate than our other patients. And the activity level is probably the primary thing that will determine how we proceed, or the desired activity level that the patient has. And then associated injuries will also have an Im impact on how we proceed, whether they have an osteochondral fracture or meniscal damage, for example. And as far as activity level goes, the consideration is really that the more the activity involves jumping, pivoting, or unpredictable surfaces, the more dangerous, dangerous it is to participate in without an anterior cruciate ligament. And the lower risk activities, which one could expect to do without an anterior cruciate ligament, are activities such as bicycling, swimming, going to the gym and working out with Nautilus equipment, rowing machines, stair climbers, elliptical trainers, Activities that are straight ahead on predictable surfaces are usually well tolerated without an ACL. And some of the intermediate risk activities are activities like tennis, golf, and intermediate skiing, where sometimes wearing a brace, a person can get back and do these activities. The activities that are very difficult, however, to get back to with an ACL insufficiently are activities such as soccer, basketball, ultimate frisbee, football, volleyball, and high-level skiing. And so if the decision is then made that a person would be best treated with an anterior cruciate ligament reconstruction, then the, the things that we consider are what kind of a graft are we going to use to replace that? Because you can't go back and just hook this torn anterior cruciate back together. It's usually damaged to the point where we need to put something else inside of the knee joint to serve as the new restraint to that anterior tibial translation. 
then we need to prepare the joint for that graft, create tunnels to place the graft, then once the graft is put into the right position, we need to fix it to the bones, and then undergo a rehabilitation program while the joint heals. And various things have been used to reconstruct the anterior cruciate ligament. The most popular two choices that people use as a substitute for the anterior cruciate ligament are first the patellar tendon graft, and the, the picture shows a, a graft taken out of the central third of the patellar tendon. And this makes a good graft, as we can see right here. It has a bone block on each end, which is very attractive. I think the downside of this graft, even though it's a very popular graft, is what we do here by taking a third of the patellar tendon in these bone blocks is a little more of an injury to the knee joint than I think is necessary to obtain a satisfactory graft. And my personal choice of, of graft to use in most situations are two of the hamstring tendons, the semitendinosus and gracilis tendons, which are two tendons the patient can function very well without, and they produce grafts like this which can be combined to make a four-stranded strong graft. There are some situations where we don't want to use any of the patient's tissues at all, sometimes because of age considerations or because of multiple ligament injuries or because it's been previously done and these grafts have been used. And in these cases, we'll use an allograft, which is a donor tissue. And this is an example of, a, of an Achilles tendon from a donor that can be fashioned into a, a very nice graft to use as an ACL replacement. And so now what I, what I want to do is, is lean upon our guests and talk a little bit about their injury and how they suffered this injury and then show some actual photographs of this, the surgery or a typical surgery to demonstrate this procedure. And so first I want to introduce Denise. And Denise, how did you injure your anterior cruciate ligament? By skiing. Having moved to the Pacific Northwest about 18 months ago and being very quite, quite athletic, I decided to take up a new sport of skiing. And with friends, drove up to Whistler within an hour of ski school. I had uh, fallen sideways um, at a very slow speed on relatively level ground and soft snow and felt a shifting in my knee. I, I had injured my left ACL and in fact had blown it a great number of years ago so I knew instantly that that instability was not good. So I um, ended my lesson, was able to walk off the hill and get to the gondola and back to my hotel and safely arrived back in Seattle to see you. And so, how long ago did you injure your, your opposite knee ACL? That was more, uh, well, a number of years ago. And, and how did you adjust <laughs> to not having that anterior cruciate ligament? I think I was just so young and at the time um, thought it was just a really bad sprain, but I think it probably took a good year for me to feel pretty confident into going back into the sports that I had participated in and then continued with my level of activity. So. Um, Although I always knew it was, had a little bit of instability, I gradually worked it back up to my ability of and walking And one thing around. we found is that sometimes a person who has good coordination and limits themselves a certain amount will be able to adapt to having one knee that is unstable. But it's very difficult to adjust to having a second knee that's unstable because you learn to depend very, very much upon that stable knee. And so injuring the second knee is a lot more than twice as bad as injuring the first knee. And so the decision was made to proceed with surgery to reconstruct Denise's knee. And what I want to do is go through sort of the basic surgery that we would do to reconstruct an anterior cruciate ligament. And, and when the patient is brought to the operating room, we use a tourniquet on the proximal thigh and a thigh holding device and then prep the, the leg free, as we can see here, this right lower extremity. And the incisions we use when we use a hamstring tendon graft are really very small. We have two arthroscopy portals and everything inside of the knee joint is done arthroscopically or with a fiber optic telescope. And then we have one incision about an inch long which is directly over the, the location where the two tendons that we use for a graft insert. We then isolate the insertion of those two tendons and this, these are the semitendinosus and gracilis tendons just as they're inserting into the tibia right at this location. So we release those, those two tendons from the tibia and then separate them and then use a tendon stripper. And this device is a, is a we slide right over the tendon and advance it up the thigh until it hits the, reaches the muscle belly and removes the tendon from the muscle belly. And then we take that tendon and cut it to the length that we need and use its suture technique through each end of that tendon that we will use later for fixation of the graft. 
And then once we have obtained the two graphs, we double both of these graphs and pull them through a sizing tube so that we know just what the size of those tendons are so that we can make the tunnels in the joint with through the bones just the smallest that are, that are possible to accept those graphs. And then we're going to look inside of the knee joint with the arthroscope and, and instead of seeing that nice anterior cruciate ligament that should run right here, we see fragments of that anterior cruciate ligament, a torn anterior cruciate ligament. And if we pull on the lower bone and do a Lachman test, at this, this time we can see that the lower bone moves forward and there are none of these fibers that are going to take tension when we do that. So we clean that out of the way. Once that anterior cruciate ligament is torn, it really is of, of no function and it's just in the way of where we want to put the graft. So we've cleaned that out. The posterior cruciate ligament is right here. And then through that same incision where we harvested the tendons, we, we take a drill guide and start a, a guide pin that comes into the knee joint right here. And this guide pin, we can fine tune its location until we have it exactly where we want it to place the tibial tunnel. And once that, that's been done, then we use a cannulated drill to, to slide up that tendon into the knee joint and create the tibial tunnel. Then through that tunnel we can create the socket in the femur where the graft is going to go and we use a, a drill guide that's schematically demonstrated here and we can see inside the joint here. This positions to the back of the joint and allows us to put this guide pin right where we want it. And once we do that we use a, a different type of drill that we can pass through the tibial tunnel up to the femur to create this uh, socket in the femur to accept the graft and this is what that looks like again we we start the tibial tunnel here drill into the joint and after that's been created we go through that to put the socket up here in the femur to accept that graft and there are different ways of attaching the the hamstring tendon graft or any graft to the various bones and the the fixation method that i prefer to use on the femoral side or the upper side is this endo button and what this is is a a little flat button that we can pass up a tiny, tiny passing channel and then flip it and that is attached to a, a tape that comes in various lengths and we measure the size that we need there and then we can loop the tendons through that to pull them up into the femoral socket. So this is, these are some hamstring tendons prepared to become an anterior cruciate graft and this is the, endo, the tape that connects these to the endo button. And so this schematically shows that socket we make and then we have this little passing channel for the, for the endo button. And we pull the grafts, here are the looped ends of the grafts going into that tunnel. The tape fills the tunnel and then the button is pulled out and flipped to lock it to the upper bone. And this is just a picture of that tape pulling the, the hamstring tendon grafts up into the femoral socket. Then on the opposite side, on the tibial side, we take each graft separately. Here is one of the tendons and here's the other and we place a screw and washer and we actually tie these around the, the screw, which is a post, and then after we fine tune the tension, we then advance the washer down with spikes to fix not only the graft, but the sutures and the knots as well. And this is then what the anterior cruciate ligament graft looks like. We have again the posterior cruciate, and these are the, the strands of semitendinosus and gracilis tendons that are the ACL substitute. And then the patient needs to go into a rehabilitation program. When we initially attach the ligament to the bone, we have enough strength to allow somebody to, to bear weight immediately and to come off crutches as soon as they feel comfortable and to get on a stationary bicycle. But we also need to hold the graft in place until the body can biologically attach it. And that's a process that goes on for about 18 months. And we don't keep the person out of high level sports for 18 months but we do like to keep them at about eight months. And so, so just a quick synopsis of our rehab protocol is we do this as an outpatient, brace them for the first six weeks, crutches whenever they can tolerate, usually they're off by two weeks. They're usually working out on a bicycle by two weeks. And most activities can be accomplished at 12 weeks, but we keep people away from the high level jumping and pivoting sports until about eight months. And this is an example of, of that scar. It tends to be very cosmetically acceptable only about an inch long and even though it's a fairly large surgery we do it through fairly small incisions. So the next person I want to talk to is James and uh, James is a former collegiate football player who managed to get through a football career without injury but after that how did you injure your knee Jim? Well I was playing soccer, uh, ball was played through and the keeper and I were kind of running at the same, you know, running at each other and we collided chest and my left foot had stuck into the ground and spun me as we hit chess 
and I just felt it kind of go pop. Felt, heard, whatever, it hurt. <laughs> and Jim bring is, brings up an interesting point, and that is the timing of surgery. As I saw Jim uh, probably within a week of the time of his injury, and it was very impressive that he could not straighten his knee. And he lacked about 15 degrees of straightening his knee, and it was mechanically locked so that he couldn't straighten his knee. And ideally, we like to wait after somebody has this injury until the knee swelling is gone and their motion is returned before we operate, and that makes their post-operative rehabilitation a lot more predictable. But there are some situations where we can't do this, and this was one of those because his medial meniscus was not only torn, but it was displaced and mechanically locking the knee joint. And this is, is an example of, or this shows Jim's knee, and this is the upper bone, and this is his meniscus that should be running back in this position, but it's been moved to the front of the joint and is actually mechanically blocking his motion. And so for Jim's surgery, what we did is we reduced that meniscus, and again, this is the torn area. And this is an ideal opportunity to repair this meniscus. And I think when it's done acutely and in association with a procedure to stabilize the knee, there's a fairly high success rate in, in salvaging this meniscus when it's torn in this location. So we use a rasp to freshen the edges of that tear, and then a cannula from inside out to pass sutures, multiple sutures, to repair that. And here's an example of three of those sutures, and there are about three more in this area. And then in the extreme back, there are a couple of bioabsorbable bio tacks that are used to secure this meniscus. And when we do this, then we have to also change the post-operative course. And, uh, Instead of uh, moving as quickly as we did in, in a patient like Denise, we like to keep a person with this kind of a repair on crutches for six weeks and limit motion, limit motion which uh, you're just at a point now where you're starting to get full motion. Is that right, Jim? And you're about how far out from surgery? Uh, 11 weeks post-op. Right. Mm -hmm. So he, he had a lot tougher task because we didn't let him do a lot of things in the first six weeks, but he's catching up now. This is a picture of that ACL reconstruction in, in uh, Jim's knee. And the next person I want to talk to is Bill. And uh, Bill, how did you injure your ACL? I injured it initially skiing. Um, same type of fall, slow, slow fall, flat terrain. Yeah. Then I re-injured it um, by getting my foot in sort of a weird position when I was climbing. Yeah. And did you come out of your bindings when you no. when this injured? That's one of the, probably the single most common thing about ski injuries is usually when you tear an ACL ski and you didn't come out of your binding. And oftentimes that happens when the, the load is a slower load rather than a high speed load exactly. because the bindings don't release as, as quickly under that situation. So you tried to get back and do some for a while then to live without your anterior cruciate, is that right? My friends that the, the ski, the, the, the jury was sort of out, they sort of said, half said, yeah, you don't really need it, it's overrated, and half said, no, you need to get it fixed now. Um, and I was sort of went into a strength program and was going to try and just, you know, increase the strength of my legs and um, and see how it went. But when I re-injured at skiing, it sort of, uh, excuse me, when I re-injured at climbing, right. it sort of drew a line and said, either need to get it fixed or go do something else. Right, and the key with, with uh, Bill is that he's the only person on this panel who's close to my age. And uh, people used to think that people in this age group didn't need an ACL, but the, clearly the thing that is, is important here is activity level more than chronologic age. And, and people more and more at older ages and younger ages are being involved in sports on unpredictable surfaces. And uh, I think because of that, this is a more appropriate consideration for more and more people. And the last patient I want to talk to is Dylan. And Dylan, how did you injure your ACL? Well, um, I, did, I did gymnastics and I'm pretty good at it, and I was getting ready because there was a meet that was coming up soon, and I was practicing this thing called a blind change when you're swinging around this bar fairly high up, and you have to let go with one hand and then um, do a 180 and then grab it again. And I didn't grab it. I kind of missed it, and but I hung on with one hand because my coach said it's better to hang on than let go because you're probably going to do something worse if you don't hang on. So I, hang, I hung on, then kind of slipped off at the bottom and land, uh, kind of landed funny, not landed funny while well, I was, I fell and kind of fell sideways. And so, um, yeah, I just heard it like that. And then I did a roll and landed on my side. Yeah. And the, th the thing that I, that is interesting about Dylan is that 
it's his age. He's, Dylan has just turned 13, he was 12 when this injury occurred. And we're finding that more and more of these injuries are occurring in children in this age group. And the problem here, a lot of people do not like to reconstruct anterior cruciate ligaments in this age group because he still has a growing skeleton. And some of the things we do to put tunnels across uh, bones have, at least offer some risk to future growth. And it would be ideally desirable to wait until skeletal maturity before doing this, but we know that if someone continues to do high-level sports and jumping and pivoting and continue to injure their knee, that they start to tear menisci, and pretty soon the risk of this is much worse to the future of this knee than there any risk of surgery. And so after all of these considerations, we went ahead and, and did surgery in Dylan, and one thing we noted was this tear of his lateral meniscus which fortunately was stable and it was beginning to heal. And I think that this has an excellent chance of healing if we just can stabilize his knee. And we went ahead and, and stabilized the knee. In this case, since Dylan still has a lot of growth left, we decided not to harvest any of his own tendons, but instead went to a tissue bank and used an allograft tendon as a substitute and, and put that in for this ACL. And, and Dylan has done very well from that. You're, how, many, how many weeks ago was it that we, you did your surgery? 10 and yeah. Yeah, and Dylan is, is, I think the important thing here is we're going to have a hard time holding Dylan down because he has yeah. his motion back yeah. and his knee is, feels relatively normal. But again, the key here is that in, just because a person is this age does not necessarily mean that, that the best thing for their knee is not a reconstruction. And if we are careful of certain principles that we use in children, then this can be successfully done in this age group as well. And this is an example of the tunnels in Dylan's knee, the endo button on the upper bone, the screw and washer, and they're crossing the growth plates, which are in this location. But the point, of, what I wanted to do with this presentation today is just to kind of give a spectrum of the kind of people and the, and the, and the variations in the injuries to the ACL. And unlike years ago when this was an open procedure with casting and a, and a fairly significant rehabilitation, now the expectation is the patient can have a full range of motion and a stable knee. And this will allow them to get back to the type of sporting activities they like. And because of that, I think it's becoming a better option for more and more patients. Thank you.